deafening noise, brute force that crushes anything in its path. They're big, they're bad, they're loud. Now, Monster Trucks on Modern Marvels. They rage like mythic beasts across the land. With their formidable powers, they have only each other for competition. The big boys with the big toys are back. It's the Milestone Motorsports Extravaganza. Each night shows Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, June 3rd, 4th, and 5th at Devil's Bowl Speedway in Mosque. Bakersfield, California. A city surrounded by farms where pickup trucks abound. Excited fans are gathered here to see a different kind of pickup truck. One that seems dreamlike. The ultimate expression of power on wheels. The name of the beast is the monster truck. And when these titans clash, anything can happen. People come to see wrecks. What we're doing is almost like a wreck every time we go out and race, whether we get in trouble or not, where there's going to be some kind of violent ride. The big challenge is these things are 10,000 pound beast, and so they don't turn real well. The noise is deafening. The stunts are unbelievable. The wrecks are incredible. It's very, very loud, which is something that doesn't come across, especially when it's in an indoor domed stadium where a lot of these events take place. So there's mud flying, people are hit in the face with dirt, they get dirty, they love the roar of the engines, the power. I think more than anything, people love monster trucks because they wish they were in one when they were in a traffic jam at five o'clock in one of the major cities in America so that they could just drive over the cars in front of them and get home. Monster truck racing is one of the fastest growing motorsports in the world. From small town dirt tracks to big city indoor stadiums, fans can't get enough of these motorized mammoths. Monster truck is an overgrown pickup truck. A pickup truck might weigh 3,000 or 4,000 pounds. A monster truck weighs five tons, 10,000 pounds. When you're in the air over, say, six, seven cars, and you're 14 feet in the air. That gives you enough time. You get to actually look around. And knowing what you have, the mass of machinery you have in the air, it's an ego booster, let's just say that. <laughs> no one has flown higher or farther in a monster truck than Dan Runty, driver of Bigfoot 14. At a Tennessee air show in 1999, he attempted a jump over a 727 jetliner. To jump this high and this far, the takeoff ramp has to be much steeper and the truck's speed much higher than Dan Runty is used to in normal racing. Passing over it, I had a chance to glance out the window and see where the tail section of the airplane was, and that's, that's when I realized, wow, this is like way up in the air. If you take a 10,000-pound truck and throw it that high in the air, you don't know what's going to happen when it comes down. It was pretty hairy. It hit hard. And on the rebound bounce, it actually bounced 100 to 110 foot before it touched down the second time. And when it was over, Dan Runty drove off with a new record. He had jumped 202 feet, 50 feet more than the old record. Even in a regular monster truck race, coming down from a jump can be punishing on the driver. Your first impact, it's a stopping impact. As the front end comes up, then so your neck goes forward, your head goes forward. And then from about here to probably about three inches under your shoulders, it's taken all the stretch. And so it, jacuzzis are driver's best friends. In the past, drivers have broken their backs when they were slammed into their seats by the impact of a hard landing. But today's monster trucks are much safer, and driver injuries are rare, thanks mainly to the technological innovations of one man. Bob Chandler and his wife Marilyn created the very first monster truck. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I remember yeah. when I used to go in the mud all the time. Yes. It would take you two days to clean all the mud out of the truck. It was horrible. 
when I used to bring it home and clean it in the driveway. Yes, yeah, so and we'd have a pile of mud in the driveway everybody liked. The monster truck was born in the mid-70s when the Chandlers opened up a four-wheel drive parts business. To help promote it, Bob decided to customize his own four-wheel drive Ford pickup. The more he changed the truck, the more attention it received. And he gradually just made this truck bigger and stronger so that there was really no other vehicle like ours. Because Bob Chandler was known for having a heavy foot on the gas, his nickname was Bigfoot. And that's the name he put on his truck. The average monster truck race lasts 5 to 10 seconds, during which about 6 gallons of methanol fuel are consumed. Monster trucks will return on Modern Marvels. Monster truck mania has proved to be highly contagious, and Americans aren't the only ones who are susceptible. They've exported Bigfoot around the world. They're big feet, <laughs> if I may, doing performances. And people look at this and they say, this is American. It's the big engine, it's the big tires, it's the big roar, it's the gas guzzlers. They seem to think that this is Americana. Although monster trucks are a relatively new form of motorsport, their roots go back a long way. In the late 1800s, farmers sometimes held contests to see whose horse could pull the most weight. But in the early 1900s, tractors began to replace horses on the farm. And by the 1930s, tractor pull tournaments known as tug pulls were being held throughout the Midwest. The tractors pulled a sled of steel that was gradually loaded with more and more weight. Early monster trucks often appeared at shows where the featured attraction was a tractor pull contest. Today's tractor pullers can be even more powerful and more expensive than monster trucks since they often have multiple engines. Like monster trucks, the tractors have huge tires, but only on the rear axle where they need the traction. Their front tires are much smaller. The tires monster trucks use today, called flotation tires, are manufactured for agricultural use. Machines like this spreader have used the large low-pressure tires for decades to gain solid footing in wet, muddy fields. Many monster truck owners shave down the thick rubber tread to reduce weight. This can lighten each tire by as much as 200 pounds. Monster truck tires need to flex because the tire is part of the suspension. That's why the low-pressure agricultural tires are ideal. The huge tires on earth movers, like the 785 Caterpillar mining truck, would never work on monster trucks. They're too heavy and too rigid. For years, the military has relied on its own brand of monster truck on the battlefield. Today, one of the most rugged and versatile is the HEMTT, made by the Oshkosh Truck Corporation in Wisconsin. The letters stand for Heavy Expanded Mobility Tactical Truck. It's basically a recovery vehicle to recover stuck, mired, or broke down vehicles. It's good for all types of terrain and all types of weather. I've drove one of these for many years and never got one stuck. The HEMTT has eight-wheel drive, giving it the traction to go just about anywhere. It steers with both of its front axles, allowing more stability in turns. Perhaps the best-known military off-road truck is the Hummer. Not only is it at home on the battlefield, it's also great for picking up groceries. I've seen the Hummer do some pretty amazing climbing. I've seen it rip through sand in the Mojave Desert going through your basic mud any place you need to be. I think it does great. Military trucks, tractor pullers, and agricultural equipment were some of the disparate elements that fused together when Bob Chandler created the monster truck. And in 1981, in a deserted Missouri cornfield, Bob Chandler was making history again. Just for fun, Chandler decided to drive Bigfoot on top of some old cars just drove up on top and drove right over him. It was really easy. And we went around a second time and pulled up and stopped on top of him. And we videotaped this. It was, it was something different, you know. I just wanted to see if it was going to work. 
Later, when Bob Chandler showed the tape to his wife, Marilyn, she didn't like what she saw. I thought it was really destructive, and I wasn't that crazy about it. So I think that Bob and I both felt that way for a long time, that we didn't like it. A promoter saw it. A promoter wanted me to do it in front of the crowd, and I wouldn't do it. I says, it's too destructive. It's just not what, the image that we wanted, you know. Finally, he convinced me to try it. It never dawned on us that this would really lead to any kind of phenomenon that would take over. But the Chandlers discovered to their amazement that stadium crowds went wild when Bigfoot crushed cars. At one of Bigfoot's very first arena car crushes, at the Pontiac Silverdome in 1983, thousands of fans jumped the railings and surrounded the truck. Our son, who was very young, was in the truck with Bob, and he drove up on the cars, and we saw a million flash bulbs go off. People started yelling and screaming, and then they all just piled into the field. I mean, jumped right over the barricades and everything and came down to the field, which, of course, stopped the show. The phenomenon caught on and became bigger than Bigfoot. By the mid-80s, there were several other monster trucks around to compete with Bob Chandler's. The new trucks had names like Barefoot, Carolina Crusher, and Gravedigger. And over the next decade, monster truck design evolved through three major stages. Stage one was simply a regular four-wheel drive pickup truck that was raised and had big tires mounted on it. In stage two, the pickup trucks got heavier frames, axles, and wheels, which were taken from larger trucks. This made the monster pickups stronger, but it soon became apparent their suspensions couldn't handle the extra weight. We started racing probably seven or eight years ago, and we found out that that wouldn't work. There's people getting hurt because they were too rough. There was no suspension on them. It was obvious the monster truck world was ready for stage three. So Bob Chandler went back to the drawing board, creating a much lighter and safer design that would become the industry standard. I studied dune buggies, I studied drag vehicles, I studied off-road vehicles, I studied truck and tractor pulling vehicles, things that I've seen over the years and kind of combined whole works. I designed on a computer a tube chassis, a frame, and put a lot of suspension travel on it. Before we were running maybe six to eight inches of suspension, and now we're up to three foot, sometimes uh, three and a half foot of suspension travel. As monster trucks have evolved, so have the skills of the drivers. Bob Chandler has doubts whether he could drive competitively today. He gave up driving Bigfoot years ago after watching one of his younger drivers recover from a difficult jump. And he came over the last set of cars on his nose. And he, he had a wall in front of him. And he had to power the truck to get it down and hit the brakes and went back up. He had to power it again to get it down again and hit the brakes and he slid sideways and just kissed the wall. Now I know I could drive the truck like he does around the courses, but to be able to do all this spontaneously, to get the brakes, get the gas, get the brakes, turn, everything else at one time, I don't think I could do it. In 1983, Bob Chandler made a dramatic new discovery about the capabilities of monster trucks. Like many scientific discoveries, it happened by accident. He was trying to get Bigfoot's rear tires submerged in a lake for a photo shoot but found it was impossible. Because not only do monster trucks fly, they also float. The high volume of air in the tires provides enough buoyancy to keep the heavy truck from sinking. That led to a race with a paddle wheeler down the Chattahoochee River in 1985. Bigfoot lost, so Bob Chandler then challenged the paddle wheeler's captain to a race down Main Street. The captain declined. The average monster truck costs about $150,000 and takes from 3 to 12 months to build. The cost of maintaining and transporting it during a year of racing can be as high as $120,000. Monster trucks will return on Modern Marvels. The modern monster truck is a triumph of technology, with more moving parts than any other racing vehicle. The power plants of most monster trucks are based on conventional Ford, Chevrolet, or Chrysler blocks. But they don't stay conventional for long. The blocks are bored out and supercharged, with a maximum displacement of 575 cubic inches. Power varies depending on how the truck is set up and tuned, but it can range as high as 1,700 horsepower. These days, most monster trucks have their engines mounted behind the driver, 
in a mid-engine configuration. This gives the truck much better balance than a front-mounted engine. From a distance, they appear to have standard pickup truck bodies, but it's just an illusion. The body is actually a fiberglass shell molded in the shape of a truck. The headlights and grille may look real from the stadium seats, but they're just painted on. The suspension of the modern monster truck is an innovation developed by the Bigfoot team. These specially constructed shock absorbers, which cost as much as $1,000 each, can handle the impact of landing from a 200-foot jump. Unlike a regular truck, the monsters have both front and rear wheel steering. The rear wheel steering is activated by a switch that instantly turns the wheels and then automatically centers them after the turn is made. This allows the trucks to go around corners faster. One of the biggest problems with early monster trucks was that the axles broke because of the strain of driving the huge wheels and tires. To make that big tire work, you couldn't get an axle strong enough for our size engine, we break axles all the time, we break transmission, we break everything else. So off the big equipment we put, we pulled a planetary. The planetary is nothing more than a, than a gear reduction at the wheel. The so-called planetary gear makes it easier for the axle to turn the huge wheels. It consists of a central sun gear, surrounded by three planet gears, which in turn are surrounded by a stationary gear. As the sun gear rotates, it forces the planet gears to walk around the stationary gear. With this gearing down, it takes less effort to turn the wheels. Monster truck driver Frank Scatini of Los Angeles used to be a motocross racer. His motorcycle experience led him to design and build one of the most unusual monster trucks ever made. Frank's truck, Monster Jerky, has a stand-up driver's position, a first in the industry. The standing up position has worked out very well for me. My advantage is more visibility. Um, I have more control of the truck. Everything's more second nature to me. If you look down to my left foot, I have a shifter, just like a motorcycle. I up shift and I down shift. On my right hand, this is my finger throttle. On my left hand, I have my front brakes. With my left thumb, I can steer my rear steering. This would be for left steer. This would be for right steer. I don't have to remove my hand. It's in full function. I can brake and steer at the same time. The stand-up position allows Frank's legs to act as additional shock absorbers in hard landings. So far, Frank's unique system hasn't won over any converts among other drivers. When Rick Swanson tried driving Frank's truck, he found it a challenge. I would say I'm probably six inches taller than Frank and over 100 pounds heavier than Frank, so I don't exactly fit in the truck as well as he does. I, I ended up doing a face plant on the dash and almost hitting it. It has been termed the greatest truck, truck gathering on the planet. And now it returns to the Indiana State Fairgrounds. Don't miss the 19th Annual Advanced Auto Parts Fall Four-Wheel Jamboree Nationals. One of the biggest annual monster truck races in the country takes place in Indianapolis every September. It's three days of total immersion in the world of four-wheel drive trucks. And the monsters are the star attraction. Some of the top monster trucks and drivers are racing here. The Bigfoot organization is racing two trucks. Bigfoot 14, driven by record setter Dan Runty, and Bigfoot Tonka, driven by Eric Tack. Steve Macklin, the owner-driver of Nitrofish, is relatively new to the game. He's been racing for only about a year and a half. I've raced with all the trucks here this weekend and been able to come out on top in a few cases and been able to not come out on top in a few cases. So the truck is more than capable of doing it. I think I have as good a, good a chance as anybody. Steve and Nitrofish has been, been uh, actually getting better every race. He's had some great races so far, and he's had a few that he's had problems with. So I think he's going to come around. He's going to be one of the great competitors out there. A guy that took his driver's test here this weekend Ladies and gentlemen, he's going to come run with the big boys. Give it up for the big dog and Doug Nelke! Doug Nelke is the ultimate rookie at this race. 
Just a few hours ago, he took his monster truck driver's test in front of several experienced drivers who had to decide if he was ready for his Class A license. Doug passed the test, proving he knows how to handle Big Dog, the new truck he spent months building. I was one of the inspectors that signed him off. If he's smart, he'll, he'll drive his own race this weekend. He won't try to just blow everybody away and show everybody he's good. Yeah, good, because it takes time. For Doug Nelke, becoming a monster truck driver is the realization of a childhood dream. Things were awesome, impressed me when I was a little kid. Uh, just been, just something I always wanted to do. We used to mud race and finally got our monster truck. Dreams coming true, I'll tell you, it's a great time. Many of the other drivers, like Eric Tack of the Bigfoot team, take time to give rookies like Doug the benefit of their experience. Tack recalls a time when the steering wheel came off in his hand in the middle of a race. You do it a hundred times, you just take it for granted it's everything's there. You hit the cars, you're up again going. <laughs> Most monster truck races are run on a straight line course, but this one is different. Called an S-Track, it has multiple turns and is much more challenging. The two drivers with the least experience seem the most concerned. Something I've never done, so it's all new to me. So <laughs> we've done straight line racing, you know, over sets of cars. The S-Course is a little bit more of a challenge for me just because of, I think, of lack of experience. So that'll present a little bit of a challenge. A lot of the, the S-Track stuff is, is driving skill. I mean, it's more driver skill than just going out and running a straight line. And there's a lot, to, a lot that can go wrong can go wrong and a lot that you have to be ready to correct for. So just once you feel comfortable, once you're through the turn, look up and find your cars and then make a slight adjustment over to them. I mean, I can say that, I may not do it. Yeah. I may be sideways coming through here going, oh, I should have listened to myself. They may be fierce competitors on the track, but monster truck drivers are known for helping each other out and treating one another like family. The thing that I found is, is the people that I go to the races with, if you're in dire need of trouble, they're over giving you a hand. So the guy you may be racing in the next round is probably helping you out or maybe even loaning you parts and, and vice versa. These guys are great. I mean, you meet all these new people and they're all just, I mean, it's like your best buddies, you know, and you just met them. It's awesome. It really is. As they get ready for the first race, Dan Runty tells Bob Chandler he's concerned about the slippery grass areas on the S-curves. I don't like these tires on this grass. No. Is that hard turning? Yeah. But at this race, slipping tires will turn out to be the least of the driver's worries. Coming up, the big race is full of big problems. An estimated four to five million people attend monster truck races every year more than U.S. Major League Soccer or the Women's National Basketball Association. Monster Trucks will return on Modern Marvels. One of the most crucial ingredients of a successful monster truck race is dirt. They're specialists in making the right kind of dirt and mud. There's a specialist who comes in a couple days early and makes sure the dirt is just the right consistency for monster trucks or for mud racers which sometimes go along with the, the monster truck racing so it's becoming an interesting world with all sorts of fascinating occupations like dirt specialist stadiums become dirt tracks overnight with as many as a hundred truckloads of dirt brought in at a cost of up to a hundred thousand dollars it can't be too sandy or contain too many rocks and the best dirt has a high clay content some race promoters own dirt in several cities, which they truck in to various venues. The dirt is sprayed with water before a race to keep down the dust. Safety is of paramount importance at every monster truck event. If a truck this big, powerful, and virtually unstoppable ever got out of control, the results could be disastrous. Please, everyone stay back. Please stay back. Everyone, please stay back. Let the officials get next to the truck. They would, and they have driven over each other. I've got a video of one of my trucks driving over another monster truck. He went clean over the top of that monster truck and coasted to a stop on the other side. And it's just, it's unbelievable that it could do that. They'll go over a four-foot wall like it's not there. Uh, what scared me from the beginning was that they would drive up into the seats of a hockey arena and if the driver has knocked himself out and put his foot to the floor, they would go all the way up those seats. They would go to the wall of the building and then roll back down.
Tragically, there have been two deaths of bystanders at monster truck races, but both occurred before a new system of engine cutoff switches was fully developed. To guard against an out-of-control vehicle becoming an unstoppable juggernaut, there are now three cutoff switches for every truck. During a race, two track officials each hold in their hands a remote radio-controlled switch. They're called RIIs, Remote Ignition Interrupters. These two switches can instantly kill the engines of the trucks racing. It's nothing more than a walkie-talkie connected to a, to a unit in a truck that just totally kills all the power. It turns off all the electrical power of that truck, it turns off the fuel pumps, turns off everything that makes it run. There is also a clearly marked cutoff switch at the back of every truck, which can be pulled by the first track employee at the scene of an accident. And the drivers have a cutoff switch inside the cockpit. When they roll or crash a truck, the drivers hit the cutoff switch immediately. But in many cases, the engine is already dead, turned off by the track official holding the RII. It's happening today through Sunday. Don't miss the return of Monster Truck side-by-side -side racing action on the new challenging S-Course with 12 trucks. Although the Monster Trucks are the main attraction, the four-wheel jamboree here in Indianapolis is a celebration of the truck in all shapes and sizes. One of the most unusual trucks on display here, and definitely the biggest, is this twin-engine Kenworth semi-rig called the CFI Red Racer. Its engines put out a total of 3,000 horsepower and 7,000 foot-pounds of torque. We modified this truck into making it a drag race truck and run air shows and drag races and we take it to all the major truck shows all over the country. Now this truck right now is running low 13s at 110 and a quarter mile. With the right set of gears and everything, this truck's probably capable of running close to 200 miles an hour. That's a lot faster than the monster trucks can go. In their races this weekend, the top speed will be about 60 miles an hour. Before a race, monster trucks often do a car crush. But today, they've come up with a new twist. This Korean import is about to feel the power of the two Bigfoot trucks. One of the best drivers on the circuit told me that he said the appeal of this sport is the destructivity. When the racing finally gets underway, the drivers pull up to the starting line and raise their arms to signal they're ready for the remote ignition interrupter switch, or RII, to be tested. After the engines are killed and then restarted, the two trucks are ready to race. Winner goes on to the next bracket, and he, he races the next the truck that wins the second bracket. And whoever sets the fastest time in their brackets gets lane choice for the next race, which is very important. And some tracks have, have advantages and disadvantages for different tracks. Although some events have purses, most, including this one, do not. The monster truck owners are usually paid a flat show-up fee, no matter how well they do in the race. This has led to criticism that it's not real racing, but the drivers maintain they compete fiercely, no matter how they're being paid. We're not racing for a direct purse, but we're racing for an indirect purse. That show-up fee is based on last year's schedule. How many events you did, how well you did, who saw you. But the reason you want to do good once you're there, well, obviously for next year, and it'll also help t-shirt sales that night. T-shirts can range anywhere from $200 to $1,000 in a weekend. Extra money. The high-performance monster truck engines need a lot of downtime between races. It's not like circle track racing where guys can go 100 laps. The alcohol, you know, supercharged engines need some time to breathe. It's more like drag racing as far as the engines are set up. You've got to have a chance for them to cool down. And you've got to have a chance to, for them to kind of regroup a little bit. The monsters are usually interspersed with other kinds of racing. Like these mud dragsters. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about five minutes away from class number five. And the guys that were competing here this afternoon in our Monster Truck Thunder Drags, the Monster Truck Autograph Session will be held immediately following Monster Truck Thunder Drags competition. There you go, buddy. 
One of the most important parts of a monster truck driver's job is interacting with the enthusiastic fans. The drivers make themselves available for autographs, pictures, before and after the event. Um, we were there till the last fan leaves with either signing t-shirts, signing pictures, whatever. The drivers of monster trucks have become sort of like NASCAR drivers. They used to be these gritty old daredevil types and now they're very articulate people who are always very careful to mention the sponsors in their interviews. They're very polished performers and very media savvy. <laughs> Jiggle. Yeah. Jiggle. There you go, buddy. <laughs> okay, get back. Get back. The kids love getting the driver's autographs, but sometimes kids say the darndest things. We've done an autograph session, and the kid getting up next to the line, and his dad said, that's the driver, so-and-so. And the kid goes, well, he sucks. He breaks all the time, which was 100% true, but it was like, oh, out of the mouth of babes, you know, you don't, you don't expect kids to be that blunt. <laughs> For the most part, the people are after the autograph of almost the truck. It's not so much the driver, it's almost the truck. After the first day's races, there are complaints that the Indianapolis track isn't challenging enough. Most of the drivers had the same impression that the track was, was just lame. It just wasn't exciting enough for the crowd. Uh, we had a talk with the, with the promoter, and the promoter agreed that there was something that had to be done. The promoter decides to make some of the jumps steeper for the next day's racing. They will also plow up some of the grassy areas to give the trucks more traction, allowing them to turn the corners faster. There will be more challenges and more excitement tomorrow. In fact, much more than anyone is expecting. In the last 10 years, sales of Bigfoot licensed products have totaled more than $250 million. Monster Trucks will return on Modern Marvels. The final day of monster truck racing is about to begin at the Four Wheel Jamboree in Indianapolis, Indiana. As recorded by our four cameras, it will be a day that turns into a simultaneous, multi-level drama. A day that truly captures the thrills, spills, and chills of monster truck racing. The track has been changed since the previous day to make the jumps higher and more exciting. They will prove to be much more difficult for the drivers. In the first race, the rookie, Doug Nelke and Big Dog, faces off against one of the most experienced drivers, Dan Runty and Bigfoot. Runty's experience wins out. In the next round, Dan Runty is again victorious, this time against Monster Patrol. But the victory comes at a price. At the very end of his run, Runty's Bigfoot breaks down and can't make it off the field. At first, Bigfoot owner Bob Chandler and his crew believe it's a transmission problem. We've got a lot of work to do to get this out of there. They can change it in a half hour and when the conditions are right, but being hot like this and not having all their tools, it might take a little longer. As the Bigfoot crew work on their disabled truck at the end of the field, their teammate Eric Tack in the Bigfoot Tonka truck and Steve Macklin in Nitrofish get ready to race. Our onboard camera on Nitrofish is about to capture the kind of race every monster truck driver hopes to avoid. As they blast off, Steve Macklin seems to be doing well. But then, on the first jump, something goes wrong. Nitrofish lands hard on its nose. Dan Runty and Bob Chandler wince when they see it. They know it must have been a painful landing. The camera shows the jolt on Steve's body. Landings like this can cause serious neck and back injuries. But Steve at first appears to be fine, and he continues driving the course. But seconds later, as he drives off the field at the end of the race, he is clearly having problems. Although the fans and other drivers don't know it yet, Steve Macklin is injured. At the end of the field, Nitro Fish comes to a sudden stop, but Steve doesn't get out, and he doesn't respond to radio calls. Paramedics are at his side just seconds later. Can you get out? You with me? You with me? How you feeling up there? You all right? You have any problems breathing? 
Can you tell me where you're hurting? How you feeling? He's alert. He's alert. Huh? Where are you hurting at? My neck. Your neck? Yeah. Neck and back a little bit. Your neck and... Leave your helmet on, okay, for me? Find out where we got. All right. Step right in here. He's okay. conscious, right. alert, and oriented. He's got neck and back pain, dude. Neck and back pain. Neck and back pain. Leave your helmet on. Okay. Grab my fingers. Squeeze. As they work on their own truck, the Bigfoot crew gets the word that Steve Macklin has been injured. He's still in the truck. He stayed in the truck down there. He's still in there. As far as I can see, when he went over to first jump there, the truck seemed to nose out real hard. I mean, he probably whipped his neck pretty good forward. That's what it looked, and the truck bounced pretty violently. Doug Nelke says he found the jumps much steeper today, perhaps too steep. They changed them here right before the race. I mean, it made them a lot taller and I don't know if that was really the right thing to be doing, you know. It's, it's sky in the trucks, pretty much. I mean, it's pretty wild. Slow as you want to go. Okay, use me if you need to, buddy. Okay. The paramedics helped Steve Macklin to climb out of his truck. Later, as he receives oxygen in the ambulance, he insists he doesn't want to go to the hospital. I'm okay. I'm really, I'll be fine. Don't worry about this. Just send me a out on the track, the racing continues. In the final round, Executioner, driven by Mark Hall, emerges the victor. At the end of the field, work on Bigfoot continues, while Steve Macklin is still resisting the idea of going to the hospital. You go get checked out, man. It ain't gonna hurt. Just kind of help me lay down. Yeah, come on. That's all I need. Although the racing is over, the most exciting action is yet to come. The climax of every monster truck event is the freestyle, where drivers go out on the field solo and push their trucks to the limits. Doug Nelke in Big Dog pulls out all the stops. For a rookie who got his driver's license just 36 hours ago, it's a knockout performance. But in the process, Doug comes close to knocking himself out. Oh, I went over to first jump, that was okay. And then when I did front of them cars, it skied up and then I jumped down in that hole and I guess it bounced. My forehead, the front of the helmet hit the steering wheel, so that was how far that head went. <laughs> and now it's time for Eric Tack, one of the most experienced drivers on the Bigfoot team, to do his freestyle. Eric's performance is a tour de force. He is a master of the wheelie, and he proves it tonight. It is a freestyle to be remembered. After watching Eric wow the crowd, Bob Chandler walks back to the pit area to check on the injured Steve Macklin. One, two, three. Steve's left arm is still numb, and he finally agrees to let ambulance attendants take him to the hospital. At 9 p.m., as Steve Macklin is getting tests at the hospital, Bob Chandler, Dan Runty, and Eric Tack are still out in the dark, deserted field trying to fix Bigfoot 14. Here's what happened. Broke the U joint in the axle. That's the U joint right there. That was the weak link. It just found the weak link and broke it. Meanwhile, at the hospital, doctors have discovered that Steve Macklin has a ruptured disc. They tell him surgery may be necessary eventually, but it's not urgently needed. One week later, in Daytona, Florida, Steve Macklin and Nitrofish are back in action. But this time, Steve is wearing something called the Hands Restraining Helmet, lent to him by Bigfoot's Bob Chandler. The letters H-A-N-S stand for Head and Neck Support. 
The helmet is used by the Bigfoot team for special stunts, like the 202-foot jump Dan Runty made over a 727 airliner. The helmet is attached to a collar and yoke system worn on the upper body, under the driver's shoulder straps. It's designed to prevent stress on the driver's neck and spine by limiting the movement of the head in relation to the body. Steve Macklin is going to need it for what's about to happen. Near the end of his first run, Steve's truck suddenly flips over on its roof. But then it keeps on going and lands back on its wheels. Steve comes through it without a scratch. The truck has lost some of its body panels, but it can still race without them. It's all part of the game in the rough and tumble, unpredictable world of monster truck racing. It's a world with an equally unpredictable future. The industry appears headed in two different directions. One is toward more showmanship. The other is toward more legitimate racing with bigger purses to winners instead of flat fees to drivers. We might end up being two divisions of monster trucks, one that does the exhibitions and the wrestling and the, and the weird stuff, and maybe we'll be the uh, group that does the real racing, and I'd like to see that. That's my goal. And they're trying to legitimize the sport, and when you say legitimize the sport, I mean we're going to have ballroom dancing in the Olympics, so who can really say what a legitimate sport is? It's a little bit of a mix of real sport, legitimate sport, spectator sport, pro wrestling, NASCAR driving. Whatever lies in the future, one thing is certain. Monster trucks won't be going away. And they won't be getting any smaller. In the big world of monster trucks, size does matter. some kind of violent ride. The big challenge is these things are 10,000 pound beast and so they don't turn real well. The noise is deafening. The stunts are unbelievable. The wrecks are incredible. It's very, very loud, which is something that doesn't come across, especially when it's in an indoor dome stadium where a lot of these events take place. So there's mud flying, people are hitting the face faced with dirt, they get dirty, they love the roar of the engines, the power. I think more than anything, people love monster trucks because they wish they were in one when they were in the traffic jam at five o'clock in one of the major cities in America so that they could just drive over the cars in front of them and get home. Monster truck racing is one of the fastest growing motorsports in the world. From small town dirt tracks to big city indoor stadiums, Fans can't get enough of these motorized mammoths. Monster truck is an overgrown pickup truck. A pickup truck might weigh 3,000 or 4,000 pounds. A monster truck weighs five tons, 10,000 pounds. When you're in the air over, say, six, seven cars, and you're 14 feet in the air, that gives you enough time. You get to actually look around. And knowing what you have, the mass of machinery you have in the air, it's an ego booster, let's just say that. <laughs> no deafening noise. Brute force that crushes anything in its path. They're big, they're bad, they're loud. No, monster trucks on Modern Marvels.
They rage like mythic beasts across the land. With their formidable powers, they have only each other for competition. The big boys with the big toys are back. It's the Milestone Motorsports Extravaganza. Each night shows Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, June 3rd, 4th, and 5th at Devil's Bowl Speedway in Muskegon. Bakersfield, California, a city surrounded by farms where pickup trucks abound. Excited fans are gathered here to see a different kind of pickup truck. One that seems dreamlike, the ultimate expression of power on wheels. The name of the beast is the monster truck. And when these titans clash, anything can happen. People come to see Rex. What we're doing is almost like a wreck every time we go out and race, whether we get in trouble or not. We're just going a hard landing. But today's monster trucks are much safer, and driver injuries are rare, thanks mainly to the technological innovations of one man. Bob Chandler and his wife Marilyn created the very first monster truck. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I remember yeah. when I used to go in the mud all the time. Yes. It would take you two days to clean all the mud out of the truck. It was horrible. When I used to bring it home and clean it in the driveway? Yes, and we'd have a pile of mud in the driveway everybody liked. The monster truck was born in the mid-70s, when the Chandlers opened up a four-wheel drive parts business. To help promote it, Bob decided to customize his own four-wheel drive Ford pickup. The more he changed the truck, the more attention it received. And he gradually just made this truck bigger and stronger so that there was really no other vehicle like ours. Because Bob Chandler was known for having a heavy foot on the gas, his nickname was Bigfoot. And that's the name he put on his truck. The average monster truck race lasts five to 10 seconds, during which about six gallons of methanol fuel are consumed. Monster trucks will return on Modern Marvels. Monster truck mania has proved to be highly contagious. And Americans aren't the only ones who are susceptible. They've exported Bigfoot around the world. They're big feet, if I may, doing performances. And people look at this and they say, this is American. It's the big engine, it's the big tires, it's the big roar, it's the gas guzzlers. They seem to think that this is Americana. Although monster trucks are a relatively new form of motorsport, their roots go back a long way. In the late 1800s, Farmers sometimes held contests to see whose horse could pull the most weight. But in the early 1900s, tractors began to replace horses on the farm. And by the 1930s, tractor pull tournaments known as tug pulls were being held throughout the Midwest. The tractors pulled a sled of steel that was gradually loaded with more and more weight. Early monster trucks often appeared at shows where the featured attraction was a tractor pull contest. Today's tractor pullers can be even more powerful and more expensive than monster trucks since they often have multiple engines. Like monster trucks, the tractors have huge tires, but only on the rear axle where they need the traction. Their front tires are much smaller. The tires monster trucks use today, called flotation tires, are manufactured for agricultural use. Machines like this spreader have used the large low pressure tire that has flown higher or farther in a monster truck than Dan Runty, driver of Bigfoot 14. At a Tennessee air show in 1999, he attempted a jump over a 727 jetliner. To jump this high and this far, the takeoff ramp has to be much steeper and the truck's speed much higher than Dan Runty is used to in normal racing. Passing over it, I had a chance to glance out the window and see where the tail section of the airplane was, and that's, that's when I realized, wow, this is like way up in the air. If you take a 10,000-pound truck and throw it that high in the air, you don't know what's going to happen when it comes down. It was pretty hairy. It hit hard. And on the rebound bounce, it actually bounced 100 to 110 foot before it touched down the second time. 
And when it was over, Dan Runty drove off with a new record. He had jumped 202 feet, 50 feet more than the old record. Even in a regular monster truck race, coming down from a jump can be punishing on the driver. Your first impact, it's a stopping impact. As the front end comes up, then so your neck goes forward, your head goes forward, and then from about here to probably about three inches under your shoulders is taken all the stretch. And so it, jacuzzis are driver's best friends. In the past, drivers have broken their backs when they were slammed into their seats by the impact of.